My name is Jonathan Goforth. This video in particular is going to be very special for you about to go take your real estate exam. These 10 questions have come from me asking uh, friends and people I know who have just taken the real estate exam, what do they remember from their test? So we have an idea of what you're going to see in 2022 and 2023 current good questions to help you really focus on what you really need to be knowing. It's not new information. This is the same information for years. It's just what are good questions to help you pass. So that's what this is going to be. Feel free to screenshot the um, uh, explanations I'm going to give you. So you have this stuff on your phone. You can glance over it again to review right before you go take it. I've been a full-time realtor for 25 years. And for the past three years, I've been listed in Forbes magazine as one of the top market leaders in the country in real estate, which is exciting. I am licensed in Missouri and Kansas. This keeps the real estate commissions happy when I say that. I am with Keller Williams Platinum Partners. And so if you would give this video a like, YouTube likes that, and it makes me feel good and it encourages me to make more videos. You're going to want to subscribe because here's what's about to happen. You're about to begin the best career ever imaginable. Getting your real estate license is the beginning of your career. So all my other videos are about how to help you make a lot of money in real estate, how to have a huge, successful, awesome real estate career like so many of us enjoy. But you're going to want to subscribe and turn on the notifications bell. It's right down here next to the word subscribe so you get notified in the future. After you're done with this video, click on a whole bunch of links in the description of this video to make it easy on you. I have a whole bunch of other test questions to help you study. Click on all those videos. There's national questions and there's a whole bunch of other questions to help you practice efficiently on current information. Let's jump right in. Let's get you to pass this real estate exam. These 10 questions have come from the recommendations of some people who have recently taken the real estate exam and mentioned they had questions like these within the last month on their real estate test. So let's talk about these 10 questions. I'm going to explain the answer for each. So you walk away from this, uh, hopefully a short video, <laughs> with a lot of good confidence that you know how to answer these 10 questions. Number one, read this with me. An appurtenance would be defined as an encroachment, a type of contract used for commercial properties, the escrow account the lender attaches to a loan, or a right that passes with the land. So an appurtenance. This is a vocabulary type of question. You've got to know what the word appurtenance means. And I will tell you this, you're going to get a question very similar to this. I saw a question just about like this when I took my uh, real estate test. And then later when I took my broker's test, uh, it's a very common question. It's a great vocabulary word. You might get a question this clear where it's asking you what is an appurtenance. You could also get a question about what a different word is but an appurtenance would be used as a wrong answer on a different question. So if you know what an appurtenance would be defined as, you can eliminate it on a different question as a wrong answer. So the word appurtenance, that's why it's on this question, is to help you possibly get multiple questions correct. The answer is number four. It's a right that passes with the land. So an appurtenance would be defined as, let's talk about what it is. What is an appurtenance? An appurtenance is defined as a right, privilege, or improvement permanently attached to the land. Examples would be an easement that gives a neighbor the right to use a driveway on your land, a shed built in the backyard that stays with the home, ceiling fans, decks, a dishwasher, but not personal property. That's what I want you to understand. An appurtenance is not personal property. There was another person that said they had a question 
and it asked uh, what would uh, describe personal property and an appurtenance was one of those different options to pick. Well, don't pick appurtenance if it's related to personal property because you can see underlined there, an appurtenance is not personal property. On a rental property, a refrigerator or a washer and dryer would be an appurtenance if the landlord is supplying it for the renters and it stays there when the renters vacate. So if you are currently renting, as so many people rent and then go from apartment to apartment, every time you change where you're renting, you want to know what stays there for you. Is there a refrigerator? Is the landlord supplying it? Is the landlord going to maintain it? And if the landlord does, that becomes an appurtenance because it's an improvement permanently attached to the land. Now, if the renter is bringing in their own refrigerator, that would not be a, an appurtenance because then it's the renter's personal property. And this word, appurtenance, the reason it's the answer of number four, it's a right that passes with the land because it's a right or a privilege or an improvement. And that's why an example is an easement to give a neighbor a right to use the driveway that's on that property. Next, read this with me. A buyer's lender has ordered an appraisal of a 30-year-old strip center. Which approach to value should the appraiser give the greatest weight when making the appraisal? Read it with me again. A buyer's lender has ordered an appraisal of a 30-year-old strip center. Which approach to value should the appraiser give the greatest weight when making the appraisal? A, the replacement cost approach. B, the gross rent approach. C, the comparison of recent sales approach. Or D, an income approach. So your answer on this is D. It's the income approach. Now, here's what's kind of funny about the real estate exam. Most, most of us, including me, do not sell commercial property. And if you are looking at getting into real estate to sell houses or duplexes, um, something like that, but you're not going to do commercial property, then you're going to be surprised. Why am I answering a question about a 30-year-old strip center? Well, that's because uh, commercial agents take the same exam. So you will see a few questions about commercial real estate. And that's why this one is on this video. You need to know this. So let's talk about it. Uh, your answer is D. It's the income approach. Now let's explain it. An, an appraiser. An appraiser can use a combination of approaches when giving value, but they give a stronger weight to the most important approach. The income approach determines what a property generates in terms of income for the current owner. That income, or potential for income, is used to determine a market value for this property. The income approach is primarily used for rental properties. Now, in this case, I, I like this question because another reason to subscribe to my videos is because very soon I'm going to be doing a series of how to buy investment properties, rental properties and flipping houses. So I bought uh, another duplex um, a few months ago and when somebody calls you as a realtor to buy a rental property, a rental house, or a duplex, or a fourplex, the big question they want to know is, what does it rent for? Or what could it rent for? You know, maybe they've got a renter in there that's been in there for 10 years, and the landlord is so nice, they've, so nice they've never raised the rent on them. So it's underpriced for the rent. An appraiser, so let's say this is your listing, and it's under contract, and you've got a buyer, 
and the lender has ordered the appraisal, just like this question, the appraiser is going to contact you as the listing agent to get access into the house. The first question that appraiser is going to ask you if you have listed, let's say, a duplex, or it is a rental house, and they can tell that because you've got renters in there. The first question that appraiser is going to ask you, what does it rent for? They need to know what does it rent for. Why? Why is the appraiser asking what does it rent for? Because they're going to use the income approach. Now, if this is a rental house in a neighborhood, they're going to do a comparison. They're going to look at comps, those comparable sales, and that's primarily how they're really going to appraise it. But if it is a rental property, they need to know what it rents for. And that is the income approach. That is an excellent question. I have a feeling you may see one just like this, or very similar to this on your real estate exam. Next question. Read it with me. Which of the following laws prohibits discrimination in the buying, selling, renting, or financing of housing? These laws prohibit discrimination based on race, religion, color, sex, disability, children, nationality, and more. We've got four choices there. A, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. B, the Code of Ethics. C, the Fair Housing Act. Or D, the Equal Opportunity Act. Let's read the question again. Which of the following laws prohibits discrimination in the buying, selling, renting, or financing of housing? These laws prohibit discrimination based on race, religion, color, sex, disability, children, nationality, and more. You need to know this answer. No matter what state you live in that you're going to take this real estate exam, you've got to know this answer. Chances are you're going to see this answer included in some form of a question on your exam. This is a great one to get correct. Your answer is C, the Fair Housing Act. Now, what is the Fair Housing Act? Let's look at this. You need to memorize what this is. This is a great vocabulary question to know what the Fair Housing Act is. The Fair Housing Act is a law that prohibits discrimination in the buying, selling, renting, or financing of housing. These laws prohibit discrimination based on race, religion, color, sex, disability, children, nationality, and more. That is what the Fair Housing Act is. So read that again uh, before we move on. Pause it if you need to. Memorize what the Fair Housing Act is. And in the meantime, make sure you subscribe because, again, all my other videos, most of my other videos are about what you do after you pass this real estate exam because passing it is just the beginning. That's the beginning of the most awesome career ever. So give this video a like just because it makes me feel good <laughs> and it encourages me to make more videos. This next question is such a good one to have on this video. The real estate commissions around the country love to test us on certain categories more than others. And valuation is one that you will see common on commonly used on all 50 states real estate exams others like the question we just did fair housing discrimination types of questions you're going to see questions like that and so this one uh let's read it together ad valorem is a latin phrase it is used many times regarding property taxes what does ad valorem mean a according to the value, B, additional value, C, value, or D, the current county tax rate. Now, this is one. This is a vocabulary one. You have got to know what ad valorem means. A um, couple reasons why. Some of these vocabulary questions are so crucial that you know some of these words because 
In this case, it's very clear. What does ad valorem mean? Uh, you may see ad valorem used on other questions as a wrong answer. And so if you know what it is, then you can eliminate it. If you know on other questions, that's not the correct answer to narrow it down to the correct one. And you'll see that again coming up on my next question. But for this, let's read it again. Ad valorem is a Latin phrase. It is used many times regarding property taxes. What does ad valorem mean? Now, if I was guessing, if I just don't know, I can't remember, what does ad valorem mean? I would be inclined to pick B because it looks like ad valorem additional value, ad value. That's just how it looks. But B is wrong. B is not the correct answer. The correct answer is A. So this is why I want you to memorize it. In case you see a question like this, memorize it, then this will be an easy one for you to get right. Ad valorem is A. It means according to the value. Now let's talk about why. Ad valorem is Latin for according to the value. So read this with me. The most common ad valorem tax is property tax. Ad valorem taxes can be charged on real property and personal property. The ad valorem taxes are flexible and based on the current assessment according to the value of the item being taxed. Look at that last two lines. They are based on the current assessment according to the value of the item being taxed. According to the value. That's what ad valorem means. According to the value. Your answer is A. According to the value. You just have to memorize it, guys. It's <laughs> just how this one goes. You're not going to use the term ad valorem <laughs> <laughs> ever in your real estate career after you pass this exam. But for the exam, you better know it. It may show up. Next question. This is another excellent one. I'm going to show you why this question in particular is on this video. Your neighbor, read it with me. Your neighbor built a fence eight inches into your yard. This would be an example of what? Estoppel and appurtenance encroachment, or right-of-way usage. Now, here's what's interesting about this video. This is why this question is, is on this video to help show you why you need to know these vocabulary words. You know the answer is not B. You know it's not B, can't be B. An appurtenance question, we just did that. That was the first question on this video. But now you can see the word appurtenance is used as a wrong answer. It has nothing to do with this question. So now that you know a pertinence, and if you forgot what an appurtenance is, just go back, look at question one. We just did it a moment ago on this video. Remember what the appurtenance is and eliminate it. That's not the answer for this. Your answer is C. This is an encroachment. So now let's talk about what an encroachment is because you need to memorize the vocabulary term encroachment. You know, when I first took my real estate exam, I did remember a, a question about an encroachment. And then when I took my broker exam, uh, I saw another question on there. What's an encroachment? Uh, so let's talk about it. So read this with me. An encroachment occurs when a neighbor builds something either on or overhanging another property. Examples would be a driveway, fence, or building a shed over the property line. Tree branches hanging over the property line into a neighbor's yard are also encroachments. An encroachment is an intrusion from one neighbor over the property line into the next door neighbor's property. And that's what an encroachment is. Memorize that, and that will give you an example as to what will help you pass this exam. Memorizing some of these vocabulary words that are so predictably going to be on your exam. That's why this video is um, made for you. It's to help you pass this test. The government's right to change regulations 
and make laws for the general welfare of the public is called, number one, eminent domain, number two, police power, free enterprise system, or laws of encumbrance. So two of these you can eliminate. You know it's not number four. It's not has nothing to do with encumbrance. And free enterprise system has nothing to do with any of this. So you've really got it narrowed down to the top two choices. Your answer is number two, police power. So with eminent domain, you have to remember they are taking the property away. That's what eminent domain is. You need to know that term. Even though the answer to this one is police power, if you knew what eminent domain is, then you can eliminate it, and this becomes an easy, easy one to answer. So remember, with eminent domain, they are taking the property away. That would be um, a highway expansion, and they start taking people's property. Now, people are going to get paid for that. The, the government will pay money for that property, but that's what eminent domain is. They're taking the property away. With police power, they're telling you how to use it. This is totally different. These are completely different kinds of terms. So with police power, they're telling you how to use it, how to use the property. For example, uh, maybe it's downtown, downtown in your city, and the government uh, is telling people where they can park or for what purposes people can construct buildings. That's police power, telling people how to use property. Next question. Mary Smith is selling her home. She put it on the market, and Jeff, Jeff Johnson made a written purchase offer that Mary Smith accepted in writing. When is the contract valid? This is a good question. Let's read this one again. This is one that you really need to know. Uh, read it with me again. Mary Smith is selling her home. She put it on the market, and Jeff Johnson made a written purchase offer that Mary Smith accepted in writing. When is the contract valid? A, three days after signing the contract to give ample time for the buyer to back out. B, immediately. C, as soon as Mary Smith signs the contract. Or D, when Jeff Johnson is notified of the acceptance. So your answer is D, when Jeff Johnson is notified of the acceptance. Now, this is something, this is one, I will, <laughs> I will say a lot of these test questions that you're practicing, uh, words like, <laughs> encumbrance, words like a lot of these different vocabulary, you're never going to use these terms later in your career. You're just not going to, it's just not going to happen. But this question uh, is so important. Let, For example, in this situation, this, this story here might help you remember this. For the past couple years, there's multiple offers on, on most everything. And let's say you are the listing agent, you have the listing, you get multiple offers, and your seller, your client, signs the one they choose. You don't have a valid contract yet until you send it back to the buyer's agent because that buyer has no idea that your person has signed it. They could be getting ready to just go buy another house. And many times this happens because another house could have just come on the market 30 minutes ago. They just got notified in MLS. They don't know that you're signing it or have already signed it, and they want to go see that other house. So as soon as you get a signed contract, as you as the listing agent, you need to email it immediately back to that buyer's agent. I suggest that you text the buyer's agent also and say, congratulations, the seller has signed your contract. And then call, call that agent, congratulate them. That gives you two uh, paper trails in writing, an email and a text that you did communicate back 
the acceptance of the offer. You have to communicate back with the buyer's agent so the buyer is aware you have a signed contract. Hopefully you remember that because these are really good questions for you to practice with. Next question. The best information source a realtor can use in determining a list price for a home is A, the assessed value of a comparable property. B, the list prices of homes not in the same area. C, the appraised value of a comparable property. Or D, what the, what the owner originally paid for it. Now, this is actually a pretty easy question. However, when you're sitting there at the exam and you're a little bit stressed, you've been sitting there for quite a while taking question after question after question, don't get tricked up on this. Your answer is C, but a lot of people will miss this one. They're gonna pick A. Uh, they could pick D. You know it's not B, so you can, you can eliminate B. The list prices of homes not in the same area an appraiser is not going to do that, and you're not going to do that either to price it. Um, your answer is C, the appraised value. The appraised value of a comparable property, that is your best information source. A, the assessed value, that's what the county is using to put a tax, a tax amount on that house. Assessed values can many times be very low, so make sure you read that question completely. Some people will read that. They're going to pick A. It looks good. They don't make it down to C to realize there's actually a much better answer there. So C is your answer on that one. This question we're going to cover for just a moment. A township has A, 36 sections, B, 36 acres, C, 23,040 square miles, or D, 16 sections. Now, I'm just going to give you the answer, and I'm going to give you the explanation. And I think on this one, if I were you, I would just screenshot it, pull it up on here, screenshot it, save this so that you can just read this. Um, your answer is A, a township has 36 sections. Now I'm going to give you this, let's read this explanation. This will help you so much. I'm going to give you more information so you can understand all the different ways you could answer this depending on how the question is presented to you. A township is six miles square. Therefore, it contains 36 square miles. Each section is one mile square. So a township contains 36 sections. There are 640 acres in a square mile. So 640 acres times 36 square miles equals 23,040. Therefore, the 36 square miles of a township are 23,040 acres. So I put the whole big explanation on there to help you guys pass any form of a question on this. So see the very end of that, 23,040 acres. But look up there at C, 23,040 square miles. If you know all the details about a township, then you can eliminate C. Because you know, I mean, good grief, looking at that, 23,000 square miles, that's massive. So you can eliminate C. And that will help you get this thing down to the point you get to the right answer. But the very top of that explanation is your real explanation. A township, we'll read it with me again. A township is six miles square. That's what you need to remember. A township is six miles square. That means it's six by six miles. Therefore, it contains 36 square miles. Each section is one mile square. That's the other component that you need to remember. Each section is one mile square. So a township contains 
36 sections. This is, this is a good question. You're just going to have to memorize it. And, and so there you go. Screenshot that and just review that over and over. Uh, before we do this next question, and then we're going to end, make sure before you're, uh, as you finish this video, make sure you go into the description and look at all the other test question videos. Those are there for you guys. Those are there to help you practice. There's another one of 25 uh, questions. That's a great video. Um, I like short videos. I don't like these hour and a half long videos. A lot of other YouTubers do. Um, <laughs> I have a little bit of a short attention span like uh, <laughs> a lot of this, and I get exhausted from an hour and a half of questions. So this way you can practice 10 questions really well and get these down. So yeah, when this video is done, make sure you go down and do all the other links. There's national questions, there's math questions. Make sure you practice those math questions. And now, let's do the last question for this. So read this with me. Regarding antitrust laws, which action can be legally performed by a licensed real estate agent? A, price fixing. B, Dividing territories. C. Selling a property you have listed to a buyer who lives in a different state. Or D. Conspiracy to boycott. This is a question you need to, you, you need to understand what the antitrust laws are. Now, a couple of the questions on this video deal with valuation. Those are important. You have some others that deal with um, discrimination, fair housing, those are also very commonly used questions, and so is this one. So we're going to cover this, and then we'll end this video. So let's read it again, and then I'm going to give you a good explanation as to this. Read it with me again. Regarding antitrust laws, which action can be legally performed by a licensed real estate agent? Uh, price fixing, dividing territories, selling a property you have listed to a buyer who lives in a different state, or conspiracy to boycott? Your answer is C. The answer is C. Yes, you can sell a property you have listed to a buyer who lives in a different state. And that will happen actually many times during your career. It happens a lot in uh, vacation states like Florida, where you get a lot of out-of-state buyers buying vacation rentals. So yes, that's allowed. But let's talk about what these other things are. You need to understand different components of these antitrust laws. So here is your explanation. Read this with me. Please give this video a like. Uh, hopefully you've already subscribed. And let's read this to help you pass this exam. Regarding antitrust laws, price fixing in real estate is when competing realtors meet up and agree on the same commission rates. Any agreement with other brokerages to set a standard commission is a violation. Dividing territories. This is when competing brokers agree to split up territories. For example, if there are two large brokerages in a city divided by a river, they cannot decide between them that one will take properties to the west of the river while the other takes properties only to the east. Can't do that. And then an example of a conspiracy to boycott is when brokerages in town make an agreement, even an oral agreement, to not show the listings of a discount brokerage that just opened an office in that city. And that, that sometimes will go on. You cannot do that. You cannot do that. Those are antitrust violations. And hopefully you enjoyed this video. I think with these 10 questions, that just probably got you to the point. You will pass this exam. Check out the other videos below. Thanks for uh, watching my video. And best wishes to all of you in taking the real estate exam.